Support for I Am Salt Lake comes from KRCL 90.9, amplifying community voices since 1979. This listener-supported music discovery station covers everything from reggae and punk rock to local grassroots activism. Listen today at 90.9 FM or online at krcl.org. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Five Wives Vodka and HostGator. We're going to be telling you more about them throughout this episode. And on that note, I want to welcome everybody out today to episode 378 of I Am Salt Lake podcast. I know there might be a couple of you that you're listening. This is your first time to the podcast. I want to personally give you a handshake and thank you so much for downloading the show. You might be asking yourself, though, what is this podcast all about? What am I about to listen to? Well, this podcast is all about showcasing awesome people right here in Salt Lake City. We're talking to authors, musicians, business owners, restaurant owners, breweries, distilleries. I think you guys get the idea. We're talking to anyone that might have a cool story to share. So welcome to the podcast. My name is Chris Hollifield. And my name's Chrissy Hollifield. How are you doing over there today, Chrissy? I am so excited because I got really starstruck on this episode. We actually got to interview Dave Colley, the host and producer of Cold Podcast. And if you guys haven't listened to Cold... It's a podcast put on by KSL about the Susan Powell disappearance. And I just soaked this show up. And when I met him, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm talking to him and like, he's really here. And so I was, I'm still fangirling. I'm so excited to share this episode with everybody. I was so excited to book this episode for you, Chrissy, because I knew how excited you would be to talk with him on the podcast. I was a little bit nervous. I was kind of, you know, you can probably, you'll probably tell in this episode that I was a little bit too starstruck and nervous while we were talking to him. Hey, we're recording today right in beautiful downtown Salt Lake City in our podcast studio, which is located in the back of Empire Merchandise. Empire Merchandise is located right at 680 South State Street. And not only does Empire have an amazing selection of vape juice and vape accessories, but this is where you can come and purchase your very own I Am Salt Lake podcast t-shirt. So make sure to stop on in, check this place out, and pick up an I Am Salt Lake podcast t-shirt while you're here. And if you want to stay on top of what's going on in the world of I Am Salt Lake, we want to invite you to go sign up for our email list. It's an easy way to stay up to date. You can head on over to IamSaltLake.com forward slash email, and that will forward you right to our email sign up. Hey, before we get into this awesome conversation with Dave Colley, Let's tell you about one of our awesome sponsors, Five Wives Vodka. Not only are they delicious, but they are local. (laughs) They are delicious. They actually have three different flavors that Chrissy and I are going to tell you about. They have the original. This is the one that's made from Utah Mountain Spring Water. It's 100% distilled corn spirit and it's gluten-free. The spring is hidden in beautiful Ogden Canyon and it's inaccessible by vehicle So they're having to hike this water out five gallons at a time. And on top of that original flavor, they also make an amazing cinnamon flavored one called Sinful. Five Wives Sinful is not like those other cinnamon products that give you that cinnamon candy taste. It's like a morning cinnamon roll and it only has 76 calories per ounce. They also have the Five Wives Heavenly. This is one of their flavored vodkas with a delicious vanilla taste. Heavenly's rich buttery vanilla flavor, it comes through without coating your taste buds with sugar and this results in more vanilla and less calories. Head on over to their website, fivewivesvodka.com. You can find out more about them, check out recipes, all that good stuff, or head on over to the local DABC and pick up a couple bottles of Five Wives Vodka. Or better yet, guys, just head on over to your local bar, ask for Five Wives Vodka, because every time you take a shot of Five Wives Vodka, you are supporting this podcast. And many thanks to Five Wise Vodka for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Let's jump into that conversation with Dave Colley when he came and sat down with us in our podcast studio to talk about his podcast, Cold. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the conversation. I like to find out a little bit about the person we're bringing in as we kind of unveil the story a little bit and find out your story and find out how you got involved with doing this podcast. But where did you grow up? Did you grow up here in Utah? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a Utah guy. I grew up in South Davis County 
went to Viewmont High School and uh, the University of Utah. So I've lived my whole life in Utah, traveled a lot for fun and uh, and for work, but never really felt a need to uproot and leave Utah. Which is rare. A lot of people, especially, I know how it was even for me, you know, 18 years old, I got to get out of Utah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. gets like the 18 year old itch to leave and then explore the world. And like I, you know, so my sister moved to New York for six years and, and came back. Um, you know, uh, pretty much all of my siblings, well, with the exception of one of my brothers, uh, have all lived out of the state. Just for me, I went right to work doing reporting straight out of college. And uh, there was, for me, no compelling reason to leave. I liked my job. I liked being in the community. And uh, I never had aspirations to go work in LA or whatever. So you went to school for journalism, mm -hmm. reporting. Where did, where did you go to school? Yeah. So I went through the broadcast journalism program up at the University of Utah. I graduated out of that in 2003. And uh, before I had even graduated, I went to work for a, a radio station out in West Valley. Do you care to share what that radio or probably? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. Uh, it's uh, KNRS. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Kind of. So then you were there and then how quickly you're at KSL now is, right. is where you're, how long have you been with KSL? So I've been with KSL since 2012. Oh, wow. So as long as this podcast started in 2012. Yeah. So, so about seven years yourself yeah. at KSL and you're probably having the time of your life, right? The best <laughs> thing that ever happened. Then. It's, it's a great place. Uh, you know, I, when I, Came out of school, I didn't think I was going to ever work at KSL, just for various reasons. Sure. And uh, when the offer came, I was at a place in my career where it, it made sense. And I have, I have really enjoyed the people at KSL, the opportunities, obviously. I don't personally think that there is another uh, radio station in the country that would have supported me doing something like this podcast. Was it your original idea? Like, did you come up with yes. the idea for this podcast? Yeah, yeah. It was something I actually pitched uh, several years ago. It took us a couple of years to reach the point where we had managers buy into the idea and the resources to even start doing some of the work. So it was it was really an outgrowth of me having reported on the story originally and just not feeling like the answers were there that I wanted. And when I went to, you know, my boss at the time and said, Hey, look, we should, we should really dive in and see what we can find out here. And, and, uh, I think there's a value to our listeners in bringing them that story in more than just 30 seconds at a time on the radio. And that's, that's really where the podcast came from. So did you really start developing or preparing the foundation for this back while the case was active? Kind of collecting ideas and, and noticing that you wanted to dig into it more deeply? I wish I was that smart. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, no, it, it really came about, honestly, uh, in 2013, West Valley City Police said, hey, uh, this case is cold and we are done researching any leads because we just don't have anything to follow up on. So here's our case file. And I took that and started going through it with some of my colleagues and what really triggered this for me was I found reference to the video recording of, of uh, Josh Powell being interviewed by, by the police the day after he came back. And that wasn't with the material that the police had given us. Uh, and so I went back to West Valley Police and said, hey, I would like to get this video because I think people are going to be really interested to see that. And it's like a four hour recording. And so I, I get a hold of that. And now I have to condense that to two minutes which is, you know, what we would call an in-depth story. And it's like, how do you do four hours of this really fascinating police interrogation with this murder suspect in two minutes? Yeah. And, uh, and it just bugged me having to do that. So that's, that was where I started thinking, okay, if there's this recording, there will be other recordings. And there's, there's, you know, we had no concept at that time that we had audio journals and things like that floating out there that we later learned about to go after. So we started pulling that thread and, you know, as each stitch came out, it led you to another and another and another. Wow. Were you surprised by the amount of, so one thing that like, cause we're, we're listeners of it. I feel like I'm listening to it right now. With these headphones <laughs> it's actually on, trippy. It's, it's, it's actually really of, trippy. To is, see. You're getting the voice. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm just yeah. like, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a little starstruck. Let's just, let's just lay it out no. on the table. But, um, was it surprising how many recordings there actually were? I know all my friends who listen, they're like, I've never, I mean, I've never met people who keep that many journals and audio journals and record things on video. I mean, it's, it's strange. It's nuts. 
So I think our society has changed a lot in that we record everything now because we all have handheld video devices that we carry with us everywhere. True. Yeah. So it's less weird, I think, today than it was 10 years ago when it's Steve Powell carrying around a high eight, you know, an analog camcorder and filming everything. Yeah. This is strange. You know? Yeah. And, and that's even not just 10 years. I mean, that's going back 20 years that he's doing this. Josh recording his voice. I think if we pull up a voice memo on, on any random person's phone, you might find 20 seconds. You don't find hours and hours a day of somebody saying, well, you know, I went to the store and then I met with my friend Joe and we went and did it, you know. And there were recordings like that that oh, yeah. you found. Yeah. Wow. Was just, it tedious to listen to everything and watch everything and just go through everything to pick out the the relevant parts? Exceptionally oh, tedious. Man. <laughs> that, that, that seems like that would not be fun. Fascinating, but uh -huh. tedious. Yeah, because you don't know when he's going to change topics. It's probably, this might be a rough question to answer, but how long did it take to make like one episode? Or I imagine you did them all at once or explain that process. Cause a lot of people don't understand the time it takes to put together these podcasts and especially your style that you did with cold being the true crime, the narrative and having all the audio and the overlays. I don't even know it's how to highly describe researched it. researched and highly edited. Yeah. I had, I <laughs> underestimated it to be honest with you. When I started out on this process, I thought, you know, I'll probably be able to turn an episode in, you know, a day or two. It shouldn't be that hard in my mind because I'm working in audio every day. Like that's what I did as a radio reporter. But the amount of script. So like to give somebody an idea, each episode was probably around 8,000 words. My piece of that was maybe 6,000, five, 6,000 words. Uh, to record the audio track for an episode took, oh, about an hour and a half between all the various, you know, trying, you know, sometimes you flub a line, you got to go back and clean it up. I would spend about a day's worth of work just going through and cleaning up that recording of my voice track. And then you dump it into a multi-track. You spend another day layering all those other recordings in, putting the music in. So the process of scripting, producing an episode, if I'm being conservative, is probably about two weeks per. Uh, when we launched Cold on uh, November 14th of 2018, we had the first four episodes done. Oh wow! So you didn't have even all of them done. You just had the first. Wow. Yeah, and we had we had the roadmap uh, for what we expected would happen, but new stuff kept coming up in the middle of our release window. So we were investigating while we were producing, and uh, like there was a really interesting example of that in one of the the episodes i want to say it was episode six five or six uh i i talk about josh powell going and uh being diagnosed with this shoulder injury 10 days after his wife disappeared we only learned about that because somebody started listening to the podcast and uh said huh uh i wonder if this person knows about this medical visit and provided some documentation confidential source. I then had to go just through the ringer trying to verify that that document was legitimate. And we didn't actually get that confirmation until like a week before that episode released. So we were actively doing the, the you know, boots on the ground journalism while also trying to just shove episodes of the podcast out on schedule every Wednesday. Did you ever have to just scrap something because something new came up? Nothing like huge. Mostly it was um, see if I can work it in later. Uh, mm -hmm. A good example of that is, uh, you know, there was an interview with uh, Josh and Susan Powell's son, Charlie, that the police did. I had been trying for more than a year to get a copy of that. Uh, the police department wouldn't hand it over. And I basically passed the point in the podcast where I needed to use it. Uh, and then, of course, I get it after the fact. And it's like, I have to include this. Where does it make sense in context to go back and revisit that? So nothing that was that was like dropped on the floor and just left. There's a question, actually. So we threw it out on Facebook, a few questions in a few different audiences in our Facebook group and on our personal Facebooks. If anybody had any interesting questions based off of that last one, uh, a friend of ours, Amber, she posed a question that she wants to know how much was withheld 
due to it being a KSL rated podcast and if that content would be interesting to the listeners and will it ever be available to us? Because I'm sure there's, because you tried to make it family friendly, right? You didn't want it to have explicit, because it doesn't have an explicit tag or right. anything like that, right? Which I'm sure it could have. Easily. <laughs> Easily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you care to talk any about any of that content or? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, and it's a, actually, that's a really great question. The one thing I want to dispel right off the top of that is that KSL did not say, we're going to do it one way or the other. The decision to not include anything explicit was actually mine personally. And that came from not wanting to basically put Susan in a position where we're talking about her without her being able to defend herself. So to kind of set out what I'm talking about, uh, anybody who's listened to the podcast knows that uh, Susan Powell's father-in-law Her husband's dad, Steve Powell, had a sexual obsession with her, and he wrote thousands of pages in his journal about all of the the things he wanted to do with her. And I'm sure that got probably pretty- It it was extremely explicit. And uh, and so, you know, the detectives had to read all that. Uh, I read all of that. Uh, Steve Powell was also writing songs. He was recording, you know, voyeur videos. He was uh, taking, you know, still photographs of Susan and- um, and, you know, cropping her face onto pornographic images of other women's bodies. Uh, he was collecting, you know, her personal hygiene products and things like this. Very, very disturbing. So was that tough to have to go through all that, though? I mean, that has to because you can never get those images out of your mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're forever. Yeah. I mean, it's part of journalism. It's grotesque. Well, it, it is, but it's not. I mean, the, the police department, when they put the case files out, they uh, they redacted a lot of that. They censored it out. And for good reason. And so I, when I got a hold of some of the case files unredacted, I had to question, you know, what is the value of putting that out publicly? What good does it do besides just satisfying curiosity? Does it advance our knowledge of the investigation or of the people involved? Balance that against, do you do harm to Susan or Susan's family by putting that stuff out there? Uh, because it is, you know, there there is a portion of the population that would latch onto that, I think, for not great reasons. So that was kind of the calculus that I used in determining. In the back of my mind, I always told myself I wanted to create a podcast that I would be comfortable with my my own mom listening to. And I know that if I go down the rabbit hole of of talking about some of that really explicit stuff, I'm I'm going to I'm going to lose that audience. Yeah, and I've never thought about it from the angle of like you say, using that information the wrong way. Mm. You know, the we don't even need to go down that rabbit hole. It becomes voyeurism hole. in and of itself. After exactly. A point, and is right? it, it, as much as like myself, it's kind of like, oh, I'd pay extra, you know, yeah, if, you, yeah, yeah. if you did bonus content. Do you really need to do that? And again, this goes back to another question. There's been a lot of kickback or, or negative, I don't know, negative. This live show you're doing. Sure. At Eccles, there's been a lot of questions thinking you're just trying to get more money. Capitalize. You're capitalized on this yeah. horrific thing that happened. I know that's not the case, or maybe it is. I don't know. Okay. You tell me. It, it's sure like a friend asks on here. I'm just got to have it right here in front of me. Uh, she says, I'd like to know why they're doing it live. It turned from an investigative podcast to seem like a money grab off a really horrific case. Yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be happy to address that. Um, the podcast, I felt strongly while I was working on it, before anybody publicly knew we were doing this, that I had... I had identified or tapped into something that was significant and important. And that was a recognition that Susan Powell had been abused by her husband in a non-physical way. And that that style of abuse in our society is able to escape detection or, uh, you know, people don't identify it, don't take action to stop it because it's not overt. Susan's story impacted me a lot in that I was doing a lot of self-reflection thinking, you know, geez, if I, in my past, if I had relationships where not intentionally, but where I was being controlling, where I was manipulating in a way where I was, you know, harming my, my, my partner. And, uh, how do I be better and not do that? I don't want to be anything like Josh Powell. 
And so you heard, I think, some of that come out in the podcast, especially in the conclusion. I really love how you have it in the conclusion every time. If this sounds familiar or someone someone you know sounds familiar to their story, you know, reach out and get help. Because I, I think there's not a lot of acknowledgement for that type of abuse. Totally agree. So you can continue. I just wanted to tell you I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Chrissy, um, because it's super important to me. I, I can't even begin to tell you the number of people who have reached out personally to myself or to KSL to express that that they have actually been impacted by the podcast in a way that they're making changes in their own lives. So that's that's huge. Uh, the live show, to get back to the the question, for me is kind of an outgrowth of that. It's a recognition that we tapped into something bigger than just Susan's story. It's an opportunity for me to talk to people who engaged with the podcast about how it came about, to give them a chance to ask some questions of people who were uh, involved in the podcast, uh, people that we interviewed. Uh, So we're bringing representatives from the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition on for the live show. Uh, for the live show. Uh, so we will be doing a live Q&A with them, uh, talking to, you know, uh, Susan's sister, um, Josh's sister, to, you know, Josh's ex-girlfriend about some of what they experienced and, and continue to experience. The venue for that, it costs money. Putting that show together costs money. And our investigation did cost money. So we hope to, yes, uh, generate some some revenue out of hosting this live show that money will be split a portion of those proceeds will be dedicated to the utah domestic violence coalition and the rest will help cover our costs from producing the podcast and uh, roll forward with whatever comes next for cold when is the live show that's on may 16th Uh, i believe that's a Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. Okay. And, and tickets are available now, I would assume. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If if they're not sold out, maybe. They, before. there's still tickets available, last I heard. Um, it's the Eccles Theater, which is, it's a pretty big venue. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we certainly could have done something smaller like Rose Wagner or something like that. And that would have sold out really fast. It's important to us that we, again, it's, it's a, it's a large venue. It's a, it's an expensive venue. And, uh, if I had had my druthers, uh, you know, I would have said, Hey, uh, $10 tickets for everybody. No, that's not, that's not my call. It's not feasible. (laughs) Right. Really. Let's actually take a quick break here. We need to play a message from our sponsors. And then there's a lot more questions that we got on Facebook that I want to jump into. So hang tight. We'll be right back. All right. It's that time of the podcast where we take just a couple minutes, tell you about one of our awesome sponsors. Now, remember, when you support our sponsors, you are supporting the podcast. So support a sponsor, support the podcast. It is a win-win, you guys. Hey, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by HostGator, which you can find at HostGator.com. Every small business needs a website. HostGator is one of the world's most popular web hosting companies, and that's for a reason. They offer a guaranteed 99.9% uptime, an excellent user-friendly interface via cPanel, and superb pricing. Like I said, every small business needs a website. We chat with so many local businesses that don't have a website. They say, well, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have social media, that's where everybody's at. True, a lot of people are on Facebook But what if Facebook goes down tomorrow? What if Facebook disappears? What are you going to do with all your customers? That's why you need a website. You need to drive your customers to your own piece of real estate on the internet. And that's where HostGator comes in. You can use the promo code podcast, and this is going to give you 30% off, you guys. Plus, you're going to be supporting this podcast. Again, HostGator.com, use the promo code podcast. Hey, maybe you don't need a website. Maybe your buddy does. Maybe your friend at work does. Hey, it all supports this podcast, right, guys? Again, HostGator.com, free website builder and 4,500 templates for you to pick from. 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 days of technical support. This is awesome. Use the promo code podcast at HostGator.com. And many thanks to HostGator for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back into that conversation with Dave Colley when we chatted about his podcast, Cold. Thanks for listening. My friend Ben Roberts wanted to know if this ever got to be too much for you to handle. He said, as a listener, and he's a true crime junkie, sometimes he just had to put his headphone down and walk away. Yeah, that's definitely 
been the case for me on a few occasions. So much of this research for cold happened in my off hours. Uh, so I did a lot of work while I was uh, still actively producing the afternoon news show for KSL News Radio, and then I would go home. Uh, I would pull up, you know, the case documents and I would be reading those at home and taking notes and things. And so it was easier for me in that time to set it down and walk away when I needed to. Uh, I took over working on cold full time in February of 2018. And at that point it became my everyday job. So I did nothing but, you know, swim in this pool for a long time. Then I would go home after work and be like, I can't right? My, my mind is still actively spinning on this stuff. And I was like, I, I cannot allow myself to do this for eight, nine, 10 hours at work, and then also do it for two, three hours a night at home. So I kind of set that off as being, this will be my time to not think about the Powells, to not uh, work on the case. I did pretty good on that. Was it hard to disconnect? It really was. Yeah. Uh, you know, my way of dealing with a lot of that kind of stuff is I like to, I like to just go out into the wild put me in Southern Utah on a back road by myself for three or five days, happy as a clam. That's how I, that's how I clean the brain out. But I hadn't really been able to do that because our production schedule was, was so intense. So I'm really looking forward to getting away. (laughs) So what, what is next for you? Like, are you doing another season of cold then, or do you care to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that's our hope. Obviously uh, when we launched this podcast, we had no concept of what uh, audience would be there for it. I mean, would this be something that we had a few thousand people locally? Would it be something that, uh, you know, people in Seattle, Tacoma picked up and ran with because of the connection up there? We were very lucky in that the podcast has done, I think, better than any of us that worked on it ever could have expected. I mean, it uh, on on its first day was was doing incredibly well, and it just continued to grow throughout the course of of our release. So because of that support, I think it makes it much easier to go back to my bosses and say, Hey, look, we have, we've identified that people are excited about listening to journalism this way. Let's do another story. What does that entail? We haven't really figured out yet what, uh, what case or or story to approach for a second season, but, uh, I, I feel pretty confident that there will be one. This isn't the only podcast that KSL's even ever done. Oh, no. I mean, there's they do quite a bit, but this must have been the one that really took off for them, I guess. And it's different, right? I, we have we have a lot of shows coming out of KSL, uh, and I think radio in general, uh, the entire industry is trying to figure out how do we how do we adopt podcasting while not sacrificing traditional radio. You know, I personally feel like, and this is rooting for the home team, I guess, but I personally feel like KSL is ahead of the curve as far as radio stations go. And, in, in, you know, we're not just putting our on-air shows in podcasts. We're actually trying to create a, a original content. This is the only show, though, that KSL's done that was scripted, that was, you know, investigative in nature. It, it was a bigger ask on the front end in terms of making the resource available to do all the investigation. I feel like that paid off. In in terms of, you know, we definitely have a, a larger audience than we had even anticipated that kind of latched onto it. And if you look at the broader podcasting, I think, environment, you have shows like, you know, like Serial, like, um, you know, uh, Dirty John, stuff like that, that have really done, done well. Uh, what I don't want to do is become pigeonholed or one note where we're just doing a story because we're chasing downloads. I want to do a story because it's important to our community. And because it answers questions that people have. What kind of recommendations would you give somebody that wants to do a true crime style podcast? Do you have any recommendations? True crime as a genre is oversaturated. Oh, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. So you want to launch a true crime podcast, have a reason. And and this was something that was important to me. You know, a lot of people have told the Susan Powell story. What justification did I have coming in and trying to do it myself, let alone in basically 18 hours? It's kind of ridiculous. I felt like there were answers that I could bring to an audience that others hadn't yet. That meant doing the journalism. So a little different than just, uh, you know, sitting around summarizing the story and saying, here's what I think, uh, which is what I think a lot of true crime podcasts are. My recommendation, if you want to get into this, um, 
find a good reason for it. Try to root yourself in in investigative techniques. That doesn't have to mean journalism, but do some digging. Find something new. Uncover something new. Uh, as opposed to let's just talk about something that we read. The in, serial in the killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that everybody's talked about five million times already. Yeah. Well, in the way you kind of presented it, it almost brings even more questions to the table like mental health. There's clearly some kind of mental health issue going on in that whole situation that hasn't probably ever been addressed by other true crime podcasts. And, you know, you're bringing more of a, a full spectrum to it, which I think it would be nice if more people did that. And thank you. I hope so. Uh, context, right? You got to build context around. And and a lot of it with the Powell case was great. There are books and TV shows, you know, ad nauseum about this case, but very few of them that I found did a, uh, I, I felt like a good enough job in kind of spreading out the cultural and religious influences that, mm-hmm. that played into this relationship. And, you know, my challenge was how do I do that for an audience that is both you know, members of this church and also those who have no knowledge of it. Uh, and I got criticized from both sides, probably fairly, um, because I'm a human being and not perfect. And, right. And, and to be honest, like the first time I listened, I was like, oh man, it's, they're basically saying if you're not a member of the church, you're a killer. And like, that was my initial reaction. <laughs> and I, I was kind of like, yeah. all right, power through, power through. And then I realized you were really just putting the story in context with the way that the people of the story saw the world. But it took me a little while to power through and, and come to that realization. And I I hear that. Part of uh, the one line that I wish I could go back and re, retrack and fix is, you know, in, in uh, I think it's right, in episode one, I talk about, you know, Steve Powell going apostate. If you could see my script, the word apostate is in quotes because that's actually him describing himself. Not thinking audibly, right? I need to say Steve Powell wrote I am an apostate. And, and that is him saying it, not me saying it. So some of those little nuances, um, people will pick this podcast apart and seek to find where my bias is, where my perspective is. I understand that, but I would also caution people that hopefully you can see the approach to telling the story was one where I tried to remove myself from it as much as possible and let the facts be what they are. Did you actually, did you get any pushback or like backlash over some of the LDS church criticisms voiced by the people that you interviewed? Not really. And there again, I mean, I, if I think about it myself, I don't, I don't feel like I actively criticize the church in any way. I certainly think some people listening to the podcast will project their own thoughts and opinions into it. Their own interpretations. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. I've not heard from anybody who I interviewed for the podcast that said, I can't believe you said this, that, or the other. I'm going to let you, do you want to throw let another read, question? I have a whole bunch of you, questions. You have Bring a whole it. bunch of yeah, questions right. over there. I'm going to let you have some good ones. I know. Yeah. From- so I have a, a group from my former work where we actually all listened to the cold podcast at the same time. And we had a Slack channel where we would discuss it and everything. Nice. So I reached out to some of them and uh, they sent me a list of questions. One of them, my friend Sam said, having been in Utah during the entire ordeal, I for one thought the West Valley police was pretty much incompetent. When I listened to the podcast, I was shocked about how much they did and a ton of empathy for them, especially Ellis Maxwell. Has the case changed the way local police deal with cases? It's a really good question. I don't know that it's changed the way they deal with cases. I certainly think uh, West Valley City struggled in the realm of public relations. You know, they had a lot of other stuff going on around the same time. Uh, as the Powell case was kind of winding up, they had a, a fatal shooting. Daniel Willard uh, was shot and killed by an officer. And public sentiment against the West Valley City Police Department was already pretty negative, And that really pushed it over the edge. I think they learned a lot from this case in how to deal with media. I think they still probably have some work to do there. But I, I'm right there as well in that when I started looking into this case, I was amazed by the sheer volume of work. We can argue whether or not you know this step or that step was the right one at any given time, but I don't think you can fault the detectives who worked on this case for not caring or not doing their jobs. They were certainly trying a lot. Some of the criticism I've heard is, you know, why didn't they go out and ask, you know, Salt Lake City Police or uh, the FBI early on to to get involved? 
some of that is jurisdictional. I mean, the FBI is not going to step in into a you know municipal missing persons case unless there's a a federal kind of reason to do so. Politically, we can talk about police organizations in the Salt Lake Valley and the fact that we have all these different uh, entities that have borders that butt up right against one another. And, you know, Salt Lake City is going to have um, uh, more money to devote to a, a homicide squad than West Valley is, even though West Valley has got this huge population. So there's some of that stuff that I think we still need to work through and mm-hmm. figure out how do our how do our police agencies work better together, uh, share resources, communicate, stuff like that. Discovering now that the West Valley police officers, I mean, they were doing a ton of stuff, but they weren't allowed to talk about it or to share it, you know, so none of it was being acknowledged and they probably, so the wrong impression of them was being put out the whole time they were working. Is there like a way for police to deal with that? Like, (laughs) you know, is there a way to... I, I, I would imagine they just. I, I would imagine they're just like, oh, we don't care. We got to do work like on our job. You just have yeah. to, yeah, and that's worry. that's even still the attitude. I mean, I know there are some of the detectives who worked on the case who are not super happy that this podcast is out there. Really? Mm. Yeah, uh, they they just wish this thing would kind of go away. They don't want to talk about it. There were some discussions in the podcast about police tactics that they really don't like bad guys knowing about. Uh, there's some stuff that I know that they thought about doing. Or, uh, you know, had planned to do that I actually didn't put in the podcast because you run the risk of saying, uh, hey, guy who's going to, you know, go commit murder, take these steps to avoid being being caught. caught yeah. Right. Uh, so my my kind of guiding line there was, well, if they actually did it, I'll talk about it. If it's something they thought about doing, probably not going to include that. Do you think if there were more information shared about the time of disappearance, Susan's remains could have been found? Tough to say. I think the first day or two, the police really didn't know who Josh Powell was at this point. Friends and family started telling the police, uh, you know, a little bit about him, about the marriage troubles. But if I put myself in the shoes of a West Valley police officer, knowing nothing about who any of these people are, you are getting a crash course in this relationship and in these personalities, you're getting fire hosed with information. If you blast all of that immediately out publicly, you run the risk of a putting a lot of misinformation out there. B there are, there are people in this case who reported sightings of Josh or Susan, who to this day insist 100% that they, you know, they know uh, Josh was at this location at this time on this day. And, we can factually show that's not accurate. And so the more you report, the more you start getting this feedback loop where people come back and and they will tell you what you've already put out publicly. So it actually can, I think it can hurt more than it can help. The biggest miss, honestly, in in finding Susan's body in my mind is it's 10 minutes when you know Josh Powell on the day after his wife disappeared is sitting in the West Valley City Police Department lobby and uh, the detective is out there putting a GPS tracker on his minivan and he's going to come in and give him the keys and, and let him drive right to wherever. And Josh gets tired of waiting and he he slips out of there without being noticed 10 minutes before they finish putting that tracker on. And it's like if they had had somebody watching him more closely, if they had, uh, you know, if the judge had signed that tracking warrant 10 minutes earlier, there's a really good chance in my mind none of the rest of this stuff ever happens. The problem is there's a lot of what ifs. Right. And that's the problem. You don't yeah. know. It, and even if it went a different way, there would still be a bunch of what, a, what yeah. ifs. Yeah. Like, that's just how it goes. Hypotheticals but, can spin out in a million directions. Right. Exactly. Do you think the remaining members of the Powell family know information or have evidence they aren't sharing? Not really. And I, I try to be careful when I talk about Alina Powell, John Powell, Josh's mom, Terry Powell, the surviving members of that family, because- they are still alive, mm-hmm. and uh, the police department uh, basically didn't consider them suspects in a crime. And so they are entitled to uh, a standard of privacy as private citizens. So if I go talking about their private lives, that's not that's not right. It's not fair to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did extend invitations uh, you know, to them to participate, to sit down and uh, be interviewed, uh, which they declined. But knowing what I know about Josh and Steve and Michael Powell, the you know the members of this family, I don't think they trusted 
particularly Josh. I don't think he trusted anybody outside of his brother, Michael, enough to tell uh, what actually happened to Susan. Have the police received an influx of tips since the podcast aired? I wish I could tell you. I'm not sure. I guess uh, you're not on the task force. I was going right, right, right. to work for West Valley Police here. We need to get one and of them in it's here. probably still technically a cold case. It is. Yeah. yeah. And it's still active. People forget that. Because Susan's body hasn't been found, uh, the case does remain active. Uh, I know for a fact that you know, anytime this case comes up in the media, the psychic tips start pouring in. By the time the case went cold in, in 2013, they had something like 800 uh, tip calls that have been made. And I want to tell you, probably half, more than half of those were just, hey, I uh, I get impressions. I think Susan's in a well in some place, right? And it's like <laughs> really difficult if you're an investigative agency having to sort through all of that. So mm-hmm. uh, bringing it up again in the podcast in this big way, I have no doubt that they've started getting more calls like that. I would hope that there's somebody out there who's called in with some relevant information that maybe gives a new perspective or it it, it generates some thought about, hey, let's go out and and maybe look at something new. But I'm not privy to that if it's happened. And tips are really difficult because, you know, witnesses are are always your uh, your memory is always kind of very iffy. We kind of make up our own things and build memories that don't exist. And so you never really know when tips come in, which one's even if they're good tips, are accurate. Right. So but you probably have to handle each one the same way, right? You do. Like I mean, it you could be to... just as good as the next. Right, no, exactly. No. But uh, I just, I don't envy that position. Well, I'll tell you personally that uh, there was an aspect to this case that very early on, we started hearing, you know, Josh Powell was seen at a strip club on the day, you know, Susan disappeared. And later we started hearing, well, uh, he had been hanging out with, uh, you know, a, a stripper and, this escort and maybe there was an affair and that narrative took root. A lot of people took that and took it as factual, Mm -hmm. but it was a, it was a lead that the police, when they chased down, couldn't find any evidence to support. So like even today, they don't say it's false. They just basically say we couldn't find any evidence to substantiate that. I wanted to jump in and say, okay, where did that information come from? Can we take kind of a fresh look at it? Uh, I was able to actually get the guy who originally told police that he had seen Josh with this escort at, uh, you know, Fat Cats the summer before Susan disappeared to come in and do an interview for the podcast and and tell his story. Uh, During that interview, he said several things which I knew to be false. Hmm. So uh, immediately I'm going, okay, well, the credibility of this tip is low. And yeah, the police spent a lot of time checking it out. They weren't able to find anything publicly. There are a lot of people who think that's truth. My job is to now come back and say, "Mm, evaluate the evidence because it's Mm -hmm. probably not. That would be so hard. (laughs) It's true. Just to really figure out what's credible, what, what to put out there. I mean, did you ever like just want to (laughs) quit? I didn't want to quit, but the process of putting the episodes out on schedule was really tight. I mean, you guys, <laughs> mm-hmm. you, I, I was going to say, I thought this podcast was I know. hard, right? <laughs> you, you, There's nothing compared w- to that. Well, but, but I think anytime you're working on deadline, you yeah. feel that pressure. Sure. And, uh, I knew in the back of my head, probably how many episodes were going to be there, but I wasn't sure. I wanted to give myself wiggle room depending on, you know, what came up and right around episode nine, I started thinking, I can't, I can't do this. I just, I'm, I'm going to miss a deadline. I'm going to let everybody down. The quality is going to slip. I'm, I'm not going to be confident in my own journalistic work that I did what I needed to do. Is there a way that I can wrap this series up and maybe say, ah, we'll come back and do, you know, the second half later or something like that. Ultimately I didn't have to do that, but yeah, there, there was a point in time where I just thought I, what have I done to myself? How do I, how is there, do I get out? Is it been kind of challenging or like, how do you deal with it? Because now you've probably put yourself in a position to be more of a public figure. Oh yeah. And so uh, you're easily accessible to people and their opinions. How are you working through that or how do you deal with that? That's a, that's a really insightful question. Social media has been amazing for this project. It's also been very difficult because I'm active in groups where people are talking about the podcast. They're talking about their theories and sharing information a lot of these kind of, you know, ideas come up where 
I, I feel responsible to step in sometimes and say, mm, you got to be careful because you're not on factual ground with that. Or, or have you considered this? Have you considered that? It's almost like putting out a million little spot fires because I don't know what happened to Susan, but I've had more access to the case files than almost anybody outside of law enforcement. And if I can be the conduit to help put accurate information out there, I want to do that. The hardest thing, honestly, with with being accessible is people who are coming to me and sharing their personal stories and the responsibility I feel to to give them my time and attention to to validate, right? Because I did take a very public stand at the end of the podcast in saying that uh, you know that I I would make this pledge in Susan's name to believe and support uh, victims of domestic abuse. And so when somebody calls me on the phone or sends me a Facebook message and says, look, here's, here's the situation I'm in, I don't feel like I can say, you know what, I, I just can't deal with this right now. And so that's that's been very emotionally taxing for me. What, what do you do when someone reaches out to you? I mean, do you have kind of a resource that you can send them to? or I mean, because that would get incredibly overwhelming. You're not a therapist. Right. And, and I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not qualified <laughs> <laughs> in solving someone's problems but what i can't right. what i what i do is i default to a believing right so if somebody tells me they're in that situation and this is something i suggest to anybody if somebody comes to you and says i'm in a bad place and i'm especially if i'm afraid for my safety or my children's safety uh the most powerful thing i feel like i can say is i believe you mm-hmm. you know not well did you think about this or maybe it's not that bad. it's like no i believe you how can I connect you with somebody who is qualified to help you? If you're here in Utah, that might be suggesting that you get in touch with, you know, the Domestic Violence Coalition. If you're in another state, let's find out what that organization is. Let's get you in touch with the legal help, with the, you know, the financial help, the the psychological help to get you out of that situation safely. I'm not going to be showing up at anyone's house trying to counsel them in their own marriage, but <laughs> – but, uh, too many people are dealing with these kinds of relationship issues. And, and we need to, in my opinion, talk about it openly in, mm-hmm. in forums like this. Yeah. Do you have any other questions you want to get before we have to completely wrap this up, Chrissy? I know there was a few more, but there some of them more, we've kind of already touched on. Them. Yeah. I mean, let's, uh, let's learn more about you now. Ooh. There, well, there's a, <laughs> so there's a few Salt Lake City related questions I like to throw out at, at people that come on the show. Where do you tell people or where do you take people that have never been to Salt Lake? Like we all have those favorite areas, buildings, hikes, whatever. What is the Dave tour? Okay. If we're keeping it Salt Lake City specific. Anywhere in the valley. It's a little harder, but okay. So like in the valley. uh, Or the mountains, whatever. Some of my favorite places. You know, you know, where's a great place to take people. I love going up. um, Let's see. I'm trying to remember. I think it's Butterfield Canyon. Okay. The the south end of the valley up to the overlook above uh, the Kennecott Mine. Because you get this amazing view looking uh, north up along the the ridge of the Ochres to like Farnsworth Peak. You can see Antelope Island and the lake, the Stansbury Island. Uh, off to the you know off to the east, you see the whole spread of the Salt Lake Valley. Downtown is like this, just like little thing in the distance. Super pretty. That's one. It's great in the summertime. Obviously, in the winter, you can't get up there because of the snow. Uh, for somebody who is like new to town. Uh, really great. Like everybody's um, would say, go to Enzyme Peak, right? Sure. Like I actually prefer if you go up into North Salt Lake, uh, there is a, a trailhead, and I'm giving away one of my favorite places here. Uh, the don't tun- worry, we don't have that many listeners. Oh, shut <laughs> up. The, uh, the Tunnel Springs Trailhead up by the Eaglewood Golf Course in North Salt Lake is an access point for the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, and uh, you can walk up above the the quarry there, where you know I-15 skirts up by the refineries. The view you get is uh, similar to, but better than, in my opinion, that view from Enzyme Peak. It takes you up to the radio towers up there. And like on a summer evening, it's just such a fantastic place to go for a walk. What would you change about Salt Lake City, the Valley? I hate to say Utah, because obviously we're not just Utah here, but would you change anything about Salt Lake? Salt Lake has so much going for it in my mind. Yeah. The challenge that that I have right now is I see growth being a major problem for the community that I love in the next several decades. And how are we going to accommodate all this population growth? We're already seeing so much pressure on our infrastructure, on our natural resources with the canyons. The one thing that I 
selfishly would like to change would be to cap the population of the valley and say, yeah. no more people can move here. It's tough because we want people to come here. We yeah. need growth. But at the same time, it's also scary because we've already seen traffic, housing, mm-hmm. Everything is like ah, the air quality. Yeah, is yeah. Like, oh, come on, it gets it gets so hard because I live here and I love it. And how do you tell somebody? Well, you know, it'd be a great place for you, but please don't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'd really love it, but don't come. But please, yeah, that's tough. What about any favorite local eating spots? I know it's a silly question, but it's one I threw in almost when this podcast started. And I have listeners that make a list almost. Oh of, yeah. Like the recommendations from Dave. What, what do you got? So I got to be full disclosure on this one because my go-to is, uh, I don't, I don't work there anymore, but I spent 15 years working for a, a little mom and pops pizza shop up in, uh, Centerville. Uh, at the time it was called Z pony. It's since been renamed Z brothers. So they got a couple locations, uh, one in Centerville, one in uh, North Salt Lake, Fantastic pizza place. Uh, I'm good friends with the owners. Love those guys. But of course, I'm biased. Sure. Take that for what it is. I Anywhere I travel, I always go to the pizza places because that's like my barometer for how much I like the city is how good their pizza is. Do you like a thick crust or a thin crust? I am, I am like a delivery style. So I like that like really bready style crust. Yeah. yeah. The real thick stuff that you can dip in something uh-huh. when you're done. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Where like I know so many people when they get pizza, they're like, ah, I throw away the crusts. And like, yeah, because you're eating garbage pizza. Yeah. <laughs> if you get good pizza, you don't throw away the crust. Um, so there are, there are a number of, uh, obviously, like Salt Lake has so many good pizza places. It's been a while since I've been there. I used to love going to um, the Rusted Sun when I lived out in Sugar House. Yeah, just no shortage of good places. I've had a heck of a time having you on the podcast, Dave. Honestly, when I reached out to you, I'm like, oh, this guy's going to be so busy. He's not going to want to come and do I Am Salt Lake <laughs> with us. I mean, honestly, I know we can get more in depth on a lot of this stuff, but I think we really skimmed the surface on a lot. I'm eager to see what you have coming in the future. How can listeners get a hold of you if they want to like send you an email or a website? What do you, what do you got for us? You bet. Um, so I'm pretty open on social media. You can just uh, search my name, Dave Colley. I should pop up. If you're interested in stuff specifically related to cold, the podcast, uh, our social media for all of that is just at the cold podcast on all the platforms. I take a lot of boring nature photos. So if you follow me on Instagram, that's uh, Dave underscore Collie. And it's like, you know, sunsets and occasional cat pictures is what you'll get there. Very cool. And and obviously, if they haven't listened to Cold, it's wherever podcasts are, Apple Podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio, wherever. Actually, probably wherever you're listening to this podcast, go Go check Cold Cold. out. Yep. Yeah. Is there any, Chrissy has a final question she likes to throw at her guests on the podcast, but do you have anything that you want to say while we're still recording? No, just thank you both uh, for the invitation to come and talk about it. I mean, it's obviously something that I care a lot about. I think it's super cool that we have investigative work coming out of Salt Lake. I'll tell you a funny story. I was asked to uh, go on the Dr. Oz show back in February and talk about the cold podcast. And so we flew out there and uh, talking to one of their producers, they were like, oh, so uh, where are you headquartered? I said, Salt Lake. And they got this quizzical look on their face. And they were like, where? LA? Like, no, (laughs) no, no, no. Salt Lake. Where? Utah. Oh, really? (laughs) Like, not here in Manhattan? It's like, no. So it's it's awesome. Like, I love that uh, we have good journalism happening in our own communities and not just KSL. So support that and Mm -hmm. uh, and appreciate your your friendly neighborhood journalists because they're doing good work. And I would just like to add everybody listening, go grab a ticket for the live show because I think it's a valuable thing that you're doing and you're donating so much to a good cause that I think we should all rally and help support that. Are we going? Yeah. I think we should get tickets. We should totally get tickets. (laughs) Now that we're on, I'm putting you on the spot here. (laughs) I'm buying tickets tonight. (laughs) Well, and thank you for that. Going back to that earlier question. I understand why some people will look at that and go, "Hmm, I don't, you know, and if that's not your thing, totally understand that. But we can do this podcast, right? Uh, the conversations you're having with people in our communities, talking about personalities, talking about issues like that's awesome. That's good. We can all do good. And, uh, if it's coming to the live show, great. Love it. Well, can you leave our listeners with a motto or a piece of life advice? I'll go back to what I said at the end of the cold podcast, uh, which was very simply, we can do better and we can be better. That is something I'm taking to heart. It's the lesson that I learned from doing cold. 
And it's something that I've asked other people to, uh, if they're comfortable to join me in, in pledging to do so, uh, you know, we, we can do better for other people and we can do better by being better versions of ourselves. Many thanks again to Dave Colley for joining us on this episode of the podcast. You can find links to connect with him and the links for the cold podcast by visiting IamSaltLake.com forward slash 378. Hey, support for I Am Salt Lake comes from KRCL 90.9, amplifying community voices since 1979. This listener supported music discovery station covers everything from reggae and punk rock to local grassroots activism. Listen today at 90.9 FM or online at krcl.org. And it is time for weekly recommendations. This is actually... So, Chrissy. Yes. How are you doing? Are you falling asleep over there? No, no, no. I'm not at all. I'm really excited. (laughs) No, this has turned into uh, one of my favorite segments because I'm like, what is going on this week that I got to share with listeners? I'm going to go first with my weekly recommendation, and that is because I am drinking one. This is the Rockstar Sugar Free, and I know there might be... Okay, so well, let's back up a little bit. So my weekly recommendation is the Rockstar Sugar Free. And I'm drinking one right now, so that's probably why I sound like I'm all over the place. (laughs) And I know there's going to be a lot of people probably giving me crap for energy drinks, but I love the Rockstar Sugar Free. There's zero carbs, zero sugar, and I need it. I'll drink some coffee in the morning, but in the afternoon, I need a little bit more of a pick-me-up. So I I go with the Rockstar Sugar Free. It's a great little pick-me-up. I am sold on it also. What is your weekly recommendation, Chrissy? So my weekly recommendation this week is actually, I I would recommend for you women to go to a barber shop and get a straight razor shave because I did that this week. I've always wanted to. And it was the best experience I've ever had. It's so relaxing. It's so much more comfortable than a salon and you get like a little back massage and the hot towel treatment and steam on your face. Now you know why and I like going into the barber like, shop. I know. It's so nice. And my skin, like my face is so smooth now that my makeup lays really well on my, you know, it doesn't like lay on my peach fuzz. It lays on my face. Did you get a lot of crap for that though? It seems like you maybe would have yeah. got a lot of crap like, ooh, what? this girl went and got a straight razor shave. Yeah, I think, I mean, especially online, other women were like, oh, are you going to, you know, are you going to have stubble or what was the other one? Like people were recommending other ways for me to get rid of my hair. It's, I just think it's a great experience. It feels good. It's fun. Why not? One day I am going to experience a straight razor shave. I've never done it and I am the probably not the best guy to be talking about him because I know zero about razors, obviously, (laughs) but I'm a little jealous that you got a straight razor shave. Hey, I'm just here for you. If things you can't do, you can live vicariously through me. I love it. (laughs) That's going to do it for this episode. Don't forget to support our show sponsors, Five Wives Vodka, HostGator, and KRCL. We'll have links for all of them at our website under the show notes for this episode, which you can find at IamSaltLake.com. And while you're there, dig through some of the back episodes. I'm sure there's one or two that you haven't listened to you guys. So go check it out. Listen to some podcasts and uh, support our sponsors. And don't forget to get on our email list. It's really, really easy. Just type in IamSaltLake.com slash email on your web browser. And this is going to forward you to a little sign up where you just put your email address in there. And that way you guys can get our, our newsletters and updates on podcast episodes and all that good stuff. And if you want to send us some physical letters, packages, or anything that you would like us to even maybe showcase on our site in our mailbag area, you can send us packages at P.O. Box 4412, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84110. Hey, you guys have a great week. Make sure to get out and enjoy some of this beautiful weather in Salt Lake City. Support local, and we're going to see you on the next episode. And good night, Grammy. 